Joyce. Joyce Conroy, you are on the block party with me, an award-winning creative director and designer. Ernie Sheffalo, this is Ernie's Corner. And when Ernie mentioned that he had a hand in the design of an LP done by Smith, Perkins and Smith, again, got me researching and talk about beautiful harmonies and songwriting. And we are looking at a lovely woman there. She has a flower. And in many ways, that was the way their music was on this one LP, just kept opening up and opening up. Now, I think someone who is getting really good at his levitation skills is going to be coming in here soon. I've been sitting here all along. I drank some funny juice this morning, and I think I'm invisible. <laughs> oh, can, no. see, can you see me? Uh, I actually cannot, Ernie. So oh, it okay. is working. Well, let me here. Let me drink this other liquid. It's like a little the white rabbit. You know, you take this pill, and it'll make one thing, and you drink that, and it does another. So anyway, I'm back. Hi, hey, it worked. It worked. Hi, Ernie. Yeah, it's great being back here on the block. You know, I, it's been wonderful. You know, I've got to tell you, I, I know I sound like a broken record sometimes, but it's just amazing, you know, uh, all the fans and the friends. And it's you've got a, a, a wonderful block here. And I'm proud, very, very proud to be part of it. It's, it's really something. And it's so weird that you should pick this cover. I mean, you know, I know it was your turn. And yeah. you had talked about a lot of things. But this cover, it's a very, it's a very unique cover, okay? And it's unique in the sense, for me, it was the last album cover I created working with Greg Braun. So in night toward the end of 1971, before I was sent out to Los Angeles to open up the satellite office, um, I started working on this album. I told you that, you know, there were other albums that I did. I did a Frida Payne album. I did, you know, the Stone's Tongue. And while we were doing that, I did a Link Ray thing. And, you know, there was all these different uh, projects and, the Smith Perkins Smith project came along and it was, it came basically because Craig was friends with Chris Blackwell and Chris Blackwell was starting and had started actually Island records, which was mainly a Jamaican reggae label. Uh, but he ended up becoming, you talk about a real power guy, you know, Chris Blackwell uh, was that. I mean, he was, he was as varied in his talents as these three musicians are and you're right these guys i mean unfortunately they only did one album started a second one like we talked about never got finished never got released and you know and and uh, you know now you know wayne has uh, passed away um and so you know it's going to be hard for them to reproduce you know that whole thing without him i guess i don't know maybe it'll be singles Maybe it'll just be bonus hits on a repackage or something. But supposedly this second album that they started was even better than the first one. And, you know, like you said, I, I think the fact that they were each one so talented and they, they, this three part harmony, it was very much like the Eagles, you know, and some of those other groups that had that three part harmony that, you know, just really made the song. And these guys were that. And, and, you know, I had never heard of them. I had never heard of Smith Perkins Smith. And I, I knew of Island Records because I was a big Bob Marley fan of Toots and the Maytags and, you know, uh, uh, all these other reggae bands that were starting to come on the scene. And Bob Marley mainly, you know, uh, and I just um, had, had never really heard of Smith Perkins Smith. And I thought I was pretty plugged in. Their sound was really kind of like you said, it was a soft rock with a touch of country. And then that combination with the three-part harmony and the masters at the instruments that they play and their voices, I mean, it was, it was very much reminded me of, you know, uh, the, you know, Eagles and, and Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, it was those, it was kind of that kind of sound. And what you see here behind me, and like I said, this was, something that I had started in New York. I actually was the only creative director that Greg Braun had because um, their office in, in Los Angeles hadn't even been you know, set up yet. Um, and so I started this album in, in New York, working in New York. I did um, 
you know, I reached out to a couple of different people that I knew. You know, the, one of them was a photographer named Bob Jenkins, who I ended up doing a couple other things with when I came back, when I came to L.A. And then there is a girl named Karen Shuken, Shuken, I think is her last name. And she did the front cover. She had she had all these pictures. And this very much reminds me of an album that I did later on uh, as Pacific Iron Year, one of the early ones. And we had already talked about Sarah. Uh-huh, Sarah uh-huh. Lady. It's got that same kind of feel where they're, I'm a real sucker for these kind of pictures. And, and there was nothing. They gave us one picture. Bob Jenkins had shot one picture of them. And again, you know, we talked about this before. It, that picture wasn't really a front cover. It really wasn't. You needed something more. It was more of a back cover, and that's where we ended up using it. But I reached out to Karen. I had seen her book, uh, and, you know, she had – it was packed filled with these kinds of photographs. She was a really good photographer, but really had this nostalgic look to what she was doing. And this was actually one of her shots that we sort of manipulated to look more like an old tintype kind of photograph. And then um, I had her tent aversion. So you see the this version over here is the way the album cover ended up looking. And then this one over here, I always get this back. This one over here is slightly tinted. I had her tint the rose, so it had a little bit more you know, impact to it rather than just a black and white cover. Uh, and then I did that lettering, that Smith Perkins Smith lettering that I think really is indicative of that country, kind of country rock, soft rock kind of feel to it. And this was one of the, handful of logos that I had done. I had started doing lettering. I mean, I was always a graphic designer when you're talking about Jesus Christ Superstar and the Rolling Stones tongue and stuff, but lettering was something that we had talked about this that I that I never really liked to do, but actually found it later in my career, my career in my 20s, that it was something that I was really good at. It was like this hidden talent that I never knew I had. You know, I mean, I everybody has Maybe I would be write an opera or I would, uh, you know, get up in front of a crowd and sing and sound the best voice they ever had. But that wasn't going to happen, you know. But this was my moment like that where I realized that, hey, lettering is something I really like to do. So I wanted to do Smith, Perkins Smith, and again, a brand that they could then use on ne- on the next album, the next album, yeah, and, and give it that country, that soft country look that would go with the photograph. It really kind of needed to go with the photograph. And, you know, I, I think that this is a really great, a great way of the two of them really kind of connecting and not one over fighting with the other. You know, it's, it's, it's a harmony that and a Zen, if you will, that I be able to create with that photograph and that lettering. And uh, I, I never uh, had a chance to meet Karen. It was only through her um her rep that had called on me. But Bob Jenkins, like I said, was pretty well known rock and roll photographer, um, like Neil Preston and some of these other guys, Henry Diltz. They were just a handful of these guys that were out there. And I had met Bob when I had dealt with him in New York and we talked about the photograph that he had already done, which let me get that up here. There's the photo that he had done. And you can see, you know, he's thinking like, a photographer would think that who's shot album covers before because they know what's going to happen is they're going to get the group the, at the top. There's going to be their name and then the group and then any other information that has the you know, title of the album or whatever. But in that top third, you needed to have that ability to see who the group was, the title of the album and possibly see the group if possible in the top third because of the way records were, per, you know, were offered in record stores. They were in bins and you only saw the top third. Yeah. You know? So, you know, he shot this shot. Um, and again, the, I, he shot some other shots, but it was, they were all kind of like this and none of them were really a front cover. So, you know, it was when I, when I had got, I got a, 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 a he, she had sent me, Karen had sent me uh, a print of this cover and I presented it to, you know, to the record company and um, they seemed to be okay with it. You know, I had a sketch of the lettering and 
it was okay because I think they realized that, you know, it wasn't really uh, a, a, a photograph that would really, you know, stand out in somebody's mind. So, you know, I uh, got to go ahead on doing that. Then I had to intent the one version to see which one everybody liked, everybody, me and the record company. Uh, and we ended up going with just a regular black and white. One. What we see in over here is this is the back cover that I use for the shot, the, the shot in. And it, it makes an okay back cover. You don't see it real well, but at the top, there's all the song titles. And, you know, I really, like I said, I, I had heard of them and the music when Craig had got, you know, some stuff from, from, uh, oh, from uh, a little bit of a brain thing today. It's been a long week. Uh, but uh, when he first got the stuff from Chris, I guess, you know, they were friends, like I said, and he brought back uh, a cassette and he brought back uh, a couple of, you know, different things on the group and bios and realized that these guys were pretty amazing. Uh, you know, you know, Steve and Tim, they were brothers and they were great songwriters. You know, and and they were they had worked with like Sam and Dave and Wilson Pickett. Yeah. Singer, some major people that these two guys had worked with, you know, and um, the the um, and then Wayne. I mean, Wayne started when he was like really young, 18. And he started working with Leon Russell and Joe Cocker and Jim Capaldi. And I don't know whether you've ever heard the Jim Capaldi version of Love Hurts, but I'll tell you what, check it out. It's I think one of the best you know, uh, the best renditions of that Love, it, Love Hurts song. And he does it in a really kind of, a, almost like a reggae kind of beat. I mean, you can see the influence that Chris Blackwell had, and it was at the same time that reggae, you know, was really, really starting to break. And so Chris was right there in the, you know, in the front part of the, all of that. And so, um, and, you know, when, when um, that we did this album, and, it, and we all, when we got the record actually and done, it was really, it was pretty cool. I never got a chance to meet um, the group, any of the guys in the group. I mainly, because I was working for Craig, Craig would work with Chris, and I never met Chris either until years later. I met him in 19, this is like 1971. I finally met him in 1983. And I had met him with Shep Gordon, Okay, and they were in the process of forming uh, uh, Island Alive Pictures, which did Kiss of the Spider Woman with John Hurt and got an Academy Award for it. So they had they had kind of, you know, what was happening in L.A. and we had talked about this before were a lot of these startup labels. There were there were the majors out here, but there were all these startup labels like you know Island and. and and alive and you know Casablanca and uh, uh, what's his name's label um, uh, uh, Asylum, you know, and yeah, so all these little labels were really signing the cool acts. I mean, Chris had signed some ma some major people to his label. I mean, it was amazing the, the the acts that he had not just reggae acts but also rock acts, and you know, I mean, there, he had signed people to his label like. Like um, in the early 70s with, you know, uh, Spencer Davis group, Roxy Music, King, Cr King Crimson, Traffic, the, you know, the Whalers, uh, Cat Stevens, and Smith, Perkins Smith. And the big one was Bob Marley. I mean, this guy was way ahead of his time, you know, and then, and then I guess it got sold again and again and they kept him on the board, but then he finally retired from it, I guess. But I did meet him. He was a really nice guy when I met him at Alive with Chef. And uh, we talked about the Smith Perkins Smith album. And yeah, he, you know, he kind of said he, he was, because these guys, these three guys were very, very talented. He kept putting them on other projects away from finishing this second album. And it, it sort of kind of was a wedge between them. There was never really any bad blood uh, that he said, but it just, you know, they, I guess they didn't really promote the, this first album. I, I don't, I don't remember it even being on the charts or anything, but you know, it was an amazing album and, and I, and you had said so yourself, right. You really liked it. 
Yes, and I, I didn't see it come through the promotional circles, you know, like for my husband's collection, because he worked in prog rock radio in uh -huh. the 70s. And uh, there is a great article about Smith Perkins Smith in The Guardian, which is very well written. I believe the uh, journalist is Paul Nettleton. Uh -huh. He mentioned that Wayne Perkins was considered as a replacement for Mick Taylor with the Rolling yeah. Stones. Yeah, and he actually, he didn't, they didn't replace him, but he was actually on Tattoo You and uh, Black and Blue. He was on those albums. Um, so, but he was never made an official stone. You know? So, but yeah, I mean, again, you know, not, not everybody gets the opportunity to do something like that with such iconic people. And these guys, they played with some heavy duty people and they produced and they promoted and they, you know, they just did arranging. They were, they were so multi-talented. And again, I guess now Wayne has passed away and they'll never, you know, maybe they'll release that unfinished album in singles or something. I don't know, but you know, you know, the, the strange thing is that that sound is yesterday. Unfortunately, even the Eagles, they're doing their last tour, you know, and, and I mean, they were one of the greatest bands, Crosby, Sills and Nash and them that said they were like these guys. They had that, kind of soft rock and they had that three-part harmony and it was just amazing. And, and now they're playing casinos, you know, and, and nothing wrong with that because it's, you know, it's a chance to still appeal to their audience, but they're not feeling auditoriums and stadiums like these guys should. They really have the talent to do that. And it's the music business like life. It's a real bitch. And, you know, you, you got, you can only, you know, there's, I always talk about moving good to great. In the music business, it's much more than that. There are four or five more levels from great up. Okay, you've got to be unique. You've got to sound, you know, you've got to have whatever it is, whether it's Alice Cooper and the Snakes and the makeup or it's, you know, uh, Lady Gaga or, you know, whoever it is. Um, you got to have, it's got to be more than, you've got to be, I don't know how to describe it other than the fact that, they're so unique and there's nobody like them. Look at David Bowie. Yeah, that's a great Getting example. Him, doing that logo. I mean, that guy was just incredible. But, you know, like a lot of these, you know, the old adage of, you know, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And it takes a toll. You know, people think, oh, great life of rock and roll and, and all the parties and the drugs and, the, yeah. you know, all the sex and everything. And it, you know what? It wears, wears, in really quickly and everyone that I've met and known I mean they would rather be home they would rather be um, you know doing something other than touring on the road it's really hard and I got a little taste of it with Black Oak for three days but you know I mean it, it sucked I mean there was always something to do and even if you were trying to sleep you'd get woken up by something that needed to be done or talked about or whatever especially when there's a few guys in the group you know it makes it a little harder uh, but you know, these guys were really, I would have loved to have met them. And like I said, I had met Chris in Shep's office years later, and he loved the album. He loved, you know, he said that the group was really happy with it. So, you know, I mean, I did everything that I could. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they do, we talked about this, sometimes they do one thing and sometimes they do more than one. And um, like we were talking about before the show today, I, I had a chance to reconnect with someone and we'll keep that person a secret for the moment. Yes. Joyce and I know, so we can't leak it, but it's going to be really good. And I hadn't talked to this artist in 50 years. And I mean, music artist. And it was like, sometimes when you, people come back into your life and there's a lot of catching up to do and you have to kind of work at it. Uh, and then there are people that come back into your life after 50 years and it was like you just talked yesterday. And that camaraderie is there, that respect. And that was the other thing, Joyce, that was really moving for me, the, res the mutual respect. Not only me for them, but them back to me. And that's really, to me, that's like when I, you know, hear from our neighbors on the block and I hear people on social media and it's so rewarding and I try to answer each and every one. I'll spend hours just trying to, because I figure if they're going to say something to me, I want to be able to at least respond back and let them know. They took the effort to do it. I want to make it, you know, it was a pleasure for me, brought a smile to my face. 
just like coming here with you, just like being here with you doing this every week. We talk about it. It's like coming home for me. And I love it. Same here with me too, Ernie. And then the the even more exciting part about it is I keep finding out more and then get to pass it on to our family on the block party. Just listening to this album. I mean, I started, um, they all three guys were very unique and you could tell talented. I was hearing a bit of America and maybe a tinge of Papa Michael Nesmith yeah, in their yeah. singing. Uh -huh. Nice, yeah. And, and America too. That was one that I left out with Crosby, Sills and Nash and the Eagles. I mean, these guys, you're right. They were very special. They just uh, now we're not, not, I, I have another challenge because, you know, we do our mind meld to see yeah. if we are on the same wavelength. And I had a chance to listen quite a bit to this wonderful LP. Um, let me hear what your picks that you think well, are the I, best. I don't, I don't know if they're the same that you have, but let's, I mean, I'm, let's try. I'm, let's I'm going to take I'm going to take a wild shot at it, you know, and sometimes Burton would accuse me of picking low hanging fruit. But again, it's about what touches me in mm -hmm. music. It's all about that. And for me, say no more. Okay. And um, I Cry Mercy. Those two songs just, I mean, they, they just touch you emotionally and move you to another place, which is what music is supposed to do. They did that. That, that like you said, this whole album was a great album, but it never got the, saw the light of day. And it's a shame. But, you know, who knows? Maybe people watching, you know, the, the block party here, our neighbors on the block will go and do research more and start listening to the music. You never know. Bob Seger was a 30 year overnight success. So I, that is my one, you know, measure of, of, of something and, and taking time. Time is everything and you got to be patient and you have to take the time. And unfortunately, these guys kind of like the Beatles. You know, I mean, they just start going their own ways. And these guys started doing other stuff. And it, they didn't get the, I don't think that they got the kind of promotion exposure that they should have. But I agree. That's the, problem. that's the problem with record. Company. We talked about one. One was the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, had they come later on, you know, they would have been huge. I, I agree with you on that. And unfortunately, that's the problem with any kind of success. You have to go through a lot of levels and you have to separate yourself. That's why the ones that get to the top. Taylor Swift, she's amazing. And what a role model for young girls and stuff. I mean, it's, you know, it's not sloppy. It's not, it's not de degrading. It's, it's really something that is positive, you know, and, and, I, and I love that kind of thing. And I mean, what did you think about my picks? I love your pick. Say No More was my first one. And really? Yes, really? it was. Say No More. Cause hey, really honestly, neighbors, we never talked about this before. We didn't talk is... about it before the show. That is the honest truth. We have not talked. I just told Ernie, I'm going to keep you in the, I'm going to keep you in suspense. But yes, Say No More <laughs> is just a beautiful song. Isn't it? And that harmony really yeah. comes out in that so much. Yeah, yeah. And what was your other pick? Already, because and, and by the way, the uh, gentleman who wrote the article in The Guardian, like Say No More, and I went with In the Aftermath. Oh, okay. I, I, that would have been my third or fourth choice. Seriously, that's a great cut, too. You know, I Cry Mercy was just. That was a good one. It was a good one. But, you know, so you know, so now you have two to play. And, you know, hopefully some of our neighbors will enjoy it and, and have learned something today. And you mentioned that about how, you know, you're learning stuff. Well, I'm learning stuff too, Joyce. You, you know, and we've talked about this and I relish our relationship. I mean, it's very special. You, you have the link that I'm missing. And you add the value that I don't know. And what it does is it makes what I do complete. It's like me working with Bob Inglesey, but I do a sketch and he does his magic to that sketch. And at the end, it looks beautiful. I do a sketch on the show every week. You add the magic to it. You do. I mean it right Thank from my you. heart to yours. You add the magic that makes it. So somebody with a, a 15 second attention span would take, you know, 15 minutes or a half hour to watch the whole thing. It's, it's not just me rambling. It's what you add to it, too. And it's so critical. It's, what we do wouldn't be anywhere near as, as, as successful as it's becoming. And you saw the numbers on this last week's show. I mean, it's, 
higher than any of the ones we've had so far at this point in the week, you know, so, or the week, actually two weeks ago, because this one, <laughs> there's already one between this one and the one we did last week. I get kind of confused, man. No, you know, don't you worry. You know, and coming from a professional like yourself, that means a lot. And, you know, really makes me uh, keep trying to uh, get better and to be even more dedicated. It's a labor of love. Yes. And, uh, oh, can I add another pick that I think was very unique on this album? Kind of okay. departed a little bit from their sound. Mighty Good Time. That oh, was a little yeah. more rocking than Yes, than, it than was. It had a little numbers. bit more energy to it. Yeah, and less country and more rock, you know. Uh, but again, yeah, I mean, that's a, that would have been in my top 10 choice, <laughs> you know. But but again, the whole album, I mean, and it's like, I remember when I get music that I had never heard and, and it you got to listen to it more than once. You got to listen to it twice or three times. And then all of a sudden it starts working its way into your, through your brain, into your heart. And then it, it moves you emotionally. That that's always the experience in the, in the, the way music would come into my life. It would be like that. I would hear it. If it was unique and different, I had to listen to it again. And even groups we were working for, not every group that I listened to their label, uh, their music or tapes, that I love immediately. But after you start, and in the art department, when we were working on albums, we would play them constantly, One, you know, especially comedy albums. We knew every bit on every, you know, Monty Python album, for Christ's sakes. You know, I mean, and, and all the labels that we, uh, the artists we were working with. So, but the more you hear it, and that's the cool thing about music, the more you hear it, the more you like it. Yes. Or you don't. You know, if you, after two or three times you hear it, and if it's not touching you, then you move on because there's so much of a selection. Got, a musician has got to be the, one of the hardest, you know, it's like next to being a surgeon or something. I mean, you got to really be good. I mean, and, and really, really, really good isn't good enough. And you've got to be so willing to take chances. I was yeah. reading, because um, you know, Jim Steinman, who uh, just, just a great writer who worked with Meatloaf, wrote you know uh -huh. many of the songs that Meatloaf recorded. And I was, uh, uh, given that he's on the spiritual birthday list, I got to thinking about a lot of the things we talk about, the rejection that him and Meatloaf faced, yeah. because yeah. it didn't fit a formula for a lot of yeah. these record companies. Yeah. But they both refused to give in. They just kept going until finally you know they were going to get that music out there people yeah. told jim steinman your music is way too long it's excessive yeah, yeah. But me sure. believed in him too and and my heavens bat out of hell just think if they had given up we, we would have never known it we would have well, never look known at the it. beatles they were yeah. rejected by every record company in the business you know i mean and, it, and it's that way alice the same way you know, I told you, Shep had a room full of young kids on phones calling radio stations requesting under my wheels. You know, and they had everything going against them, including not Bizarre Records, but Warner Brothers. And we talked about that before, too. So Shep, God bless him, and Alice, they stuck to it. And just like the ones that you're talking about that. And that's part of the, you know, the difference between good to great and then great beyond great. And, and some people will stop at good and be satisfied. They'll play little clubs and bar, birthday parties and bar mitzvahs. And then they, you move up the, you know, the, the, the steps to being something really, really special. And again, I always, like I said, I love Bob Seger. He was 30 year, 30 year overnight success. It's just amazing. The ones that stick to it and because they love it enough and believe it enough. Leon Russell was another one. Oh, it, yes. I always loved him. The Carney album was one of the best albums ever. Uh, we had done some stuff with Good Thunder that was on his label, uh, Shelter Records. And uh, we had we had talked about that before, that whole opportunity that he passed on. But, you know, Leon Russell was an incredible musician and was like that. He started out on the Grand Old Opry playing in, you know, tuxedo, playing piano with like Liberace candlesticks on the piano. You know, and people go, wow, well, you know, that's not the Leon Russell I know, the master of time and space. Are you kidding? <laughs> I can believe it. There was and something I had found out about Leon and Snuff Garrett, you know, uh, Snuff Garrett, the yeah. producer at Liberty Records. Yeah. The Monkees, actually, uh, Don Kirshner brought in Snuff Garrett before Boyce and Hart, you know, to produce the Monkees. And sadly, it wasn't a good collaboration. But Leon Russell was involved in that because uh, well, Leon was a great Garrett. arranger. I'll take you back one more level. Snuff Garrett was Ed Silver's partner in Viva Music. 
Wow. And they, they had Viva Music, and Ed bought Snuff out. Snuff went and bought Nudie's, the Western shop, in the famous Western shop in the Valley. And Ed sold Viva Music to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers made it Warner Brothers Music and put Ed as president of it. And I know all that because Ed Silvers was the boyfriend of Ingrid Hinky, the girl who did mm. the Toys in the Attic illustration <laughs> and was working at Pacific Eye and and actually lived with Bonnie and I for about three years. So, I mean, it all, Joyce, it's all connected. It's just a matter of when you plug in and when you plug out. Yeah. And everything else in between is all connected. It's like the Celestine prophecy. We talked about that before too. It's all connected. And you and I are connected. We're connected from now forever forever Joyce and that that's really something and I again I love you for letting me do this with you um we've done over almost a year and a half now I can't believe it it's just I I I went back and I looked and I it time really flew by very fast and and we just keep on covering so many great things and we we're about we're not even halfway through Ooh. And that's the exciting part about it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, again, thank you so much. Love you. Love the neighbors and great picks. And thank you so much for this, Joyce. I really love you for 